Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this, the latest in a series of lectures uh, that form the introductory first year of our History of Capitalism series at the Lugotin Institute. And the History of Capitalism series forms part of the Cultural Perspective program that I direct as the senior advisor. And uh, my name is Howard Gibson. Um, what should be the nature of the relationship between business or commerce and politics or public affairs? What is the nature of corruption? How do you detect it? And what's wrong with lobbying? Well, these are questions that are how gained a great currency in the political culture of our own time. But they first became really sensational questions uh, in the years that saw the impeachment of Warren Hastings, the Governor General, or the Office of British India uh, in the years between 1788 uh, and 1795. And it was Warren Hastings whose career had been formed in the service of the British East India Company, that singular organisation that uh, emerged in the middle of the 17th century and then re the years after the celebrated battle of Classic 1746, when uh, the whole way in British India came under the effective administration uh, of what had been the Sir John Stock Company, a trading organisation. Uh, it's fair to say, uh, as I think. Um, uh, our student speaker might agree with this evening, uh, the reputation of the East India Company bit checkered in terms of uh, orthodox historiography and some not so orthodox bits of historiography as well. Uh, very much a, a matter of likes and shades. There's brigadish, uh, there are uh, romantic, fashion like episodes uh, of, uh, of daring do, uh, private armies. Um, and there's also a fantastic story of private independent scholarship, all those class in the East India Company, who in their own time have often wrote uh, the magnificent histories in the subcontinent, the straw and so on. Um, so, like any great historical question, the, the question of the reputation of the East India Company uh, is, is rather complicated. There's, there's light and shade, the answers are not at all this. But to guide us through this, the latest 18th century episode, History of capitalism and the relationship between business, politics, the emergence of moneyed interests in the 18th century, we are indeed fortunate to have this. Uh, the preeminent historian of the East India Company, Hugh Bird. And uh, Hugh and I first encountered each other some years ago uh, as young masters of rugby school, when with a characteristic insouciance and um, disregard for the orthodoxy of the environment. Uh, he decided that he was going to push association for tomorrow um, rather than the, the overall ball. And then uh, the return to academic life uh, shortly afterwards um, has seen a whole series of celebrated uh, publications, revenue and reform, uh, the Indian question in British politics, uh, largely in fact, I think, in the 1750s and 1760s. Um, it really changed the way in which we thought about the 18th century empire. Uh, and the nature of business and commercial enterprise in the 18th century. Um, we are looking for very much to very few talking about the East India Company. Um, it's a morally complicated story. It challenges historians of capitalism. It challenges defenders of capitalism. Um, and we do our for liberal time. Capitalism needs its honest friends as well as sometimes its future critics. Humor. Um, first of all, my apology. Uh, my voice was on this last late 
I gave uh, four lectures last uh, Thursday and Friday. The last of those was to the Swansea University Survivors Club, uh, all of whom were graduates who had graduated before 1939. And the instruction was to speak to them loudly and slowly, uh, and this is a consequence of that. So bear with me, I have a supply of fishermen's friends and, and halls, uh, menthol and, and water. Um, I'm going to cover a lot in a short space of time, and to ease the way forward, I pre-circulated uh, some readings to you all via the Institute. So of course now, as I always say to my first year students, is there anyone out there who hasn't done the reading? <laughs> seeing me afterwards. Um, the reason I did that was there are many definitional issues related to this vast, with how it's a very complicated and morally challenged uh, subject. And I, I hope by circulating some very basic background information that that would enable me not to spend half of the lecture you know, explaining where India is or where Calcutta is and, and what a joint stock company is and so on. So in that your leisure, you can fill in the gaps, perhaps, uh, by reading the material that I circulated. Now, following on uh, from the earlier lectures uh, in this uh, series, I think we're really looking at the beginning of the East India Company uh, in the first few decades of the 17th century, which I think represents a key moment in the history of capitalism. It's really three reasons. The first reason being that those decades witness the quickening pace of European expansion uh, in the form of very aggressive plantation settlement in the Atlantic world, the settlement of colonies in particular in North America, and the emergence of much more systematic commercial activity in the Indian Ocean Basin uh, in the century or so before that. Uh, after the opening up uh, of the Indian Ocean uh, to European uh, discoverers. There have been episodic haphazard attempts to trade with the Indies, but what we find happening from 1600 onwards is a much more concerted and organized attempt to open up regular routine commercial interaction between Europe uh, and Asia. So that was the first uh, I think step change, if you can use that dreadful phrase, uh, that occurs uh, in the first decades of the 17th century. Secondly, we find the establishment of joint stock companies to facilitate that process of aggressive uh, colonialism, aggressive commercialism, if you like. Because now, instead of the single voyage investment when individuals would plunge their capital into the purchase and funding of a ship to sail out to Indonesia and back, or uh, to North America and back, now we have a different form of organization emerging which focuses on the pooling of capital to enable long distance trade to take place so that it can be conducted over several years. The whole length of a voyage to the East Indies and back could take three years or more. The voyage out, searching for commodities, the return, the sale, and so on, meant that capital was locked up and tied up for longer periods of time. And it was necessary to pool resources to enable that to happen. And that type of investment was necessary for the very expensive infrastructure that was necessary to support such a trade. Uh, building of ships, construction of dockyards, and of course in Asia, the construction of factories, the settlements where the trade took place. There had to be a lot of initial capital investment to enable Europeans to trade uh, in, uh, in the East. Now what in effect that saw happening was a separation between the ownership and management of capital for the first time. Individuals would entrust their savings, their capital, to other people to manage on their behalf. And that really represents the emergence for the first time of the form of enterprise that we're familiar with today. These joint stock companies uh, developed specialized bureaucratic structures to manage that trade and that money. No longer the single merchant 
or single company operating alone out of the counting house, but a much more complicated and complex set of processes was required to uh, project that capital uh, into uh, the Indian Ocean world. And we see the emergence of transferable shares as joint stocks became permanent. You could sell your share in the venture and float it on a market where it would command a value and you could pass that on to somebody else. So the second important change is the development of the joint stock company. Thirdly, and um, linking those two together, we see in the early uh, 17th century the granting of exclusive trading privileges in the form of monopolies granted by crowns or sovereign powers in return for payment. Companies or groups of merchants would purchase the right to do something uh, from a monarch who in effect would be licensing them to represent the state, the crown, in a particular venture. And what this did, in effect, was privatise national overseas activity and this enabled companies, such as the East India Company, to act with delegated sovereign powers, which included, embedded in their charters, the right to protect themselves, to use armed force in support of trade, and to negotiate treaties. Quite a formidable portfolio of powers were bound up with the notion of a charter. So those three things are going on at the beginning of the 17th century. And it's against that background that the English East India Company emerged, having been granted a charter by Elizabeth I on the last day of 1600, when it was granted the sole right to conduct English trade east of the Cape of Good Hope. That whole vast area of the Indian Ocean world was now in the grasp of this company uh, of investors, which included the great and the good of the city of London and the elite of the southeast uh, of England. Now, the company, it must be stressed, was by no means the first such company, nor was it conspicuously successful in its first uh, few decades. It had a very bumpy ride uh, indeed up until uh, the early 18th century. But by 1815, leaping forward now 200 years, it was by far the most powerful commercial organization in the world, and its private armed forces had kind of conquered much of the Indian subcontinent. So this story sees the emergence, the transformation, and then the consolidation of commercial power, which is translated into real, tangible, sovereign force. Now, at the same time all that was happening, the company, looking at one of the major themes here, was embedding itself at the very heart <coughs> of the English state, later the British state, and the city of London, where together with a much younger and far less mature bank of England, it formed part of the moneyed interest whose influence on policy making and decision making was more pervasive. This is a painting of East India House, the company's headquarters in Leatherhall Street, um, 1817. Um, today, not a scrap remains. Uh, built on that site now is a rather different monument to capitalism, the new Lloyds Building, described by Prince Charles so wonderfully as a carbon call. Uh, this is rather different. Um, it lies perhaps 400 yards away from the Bank of England, a couple of hundred yards away from the Royal Exchange, and it gives architectural expression, I think, to British commercial relations uh, with Asia. But the triumvirate, the bank, the Royal Exchange, the East India Company, are the moneyed interest. Of course, later, the much more junior Lloyds joins them. But I think it would be left in little doubt uh, in 1817 when walking along Leatherhall Street that this was the heartbeat of something rather special, commercial empire of Britain. 
And as you can see, the building itself gives architectural expression to exchange with the East. If we were to look at this in some detail and deconstruct it, what of course you can see is Britannia receiving very peacefully, of course, the wealth and the treasures uh, of Asia. And what the artist has done here, of course, uh, in the scene that we can see being played out uh, in the street, um, is uh, sort of exotic commodities being carried uh, to the warehouses uh, in Fenchurch Street, Fenchurch Street, um, Cutler Street, uh, and so on. This was HQ, and this is where men like Charles Lamb, uh, Malthus, John Stuart Mill wrote the dispatches, the treatises that shaped the development of the British Empire in India. Very few of them ever travelled to India, but from there they directed uh, the operation. Like. And now at least, uh, there is a trace. It's almost as if the East India Company has been airbrushed out of history. I quite often get asked by Indian film crews to take them on a guided tour of the site of the East India Company in London, and it's blooming hard work because there isn't much to show them. There is a pub with the East India Arms um, in Fenchurch Street, now much filmed, and I often enjoy free hospitality there. Um, we go to the Cutler Street Warehouse Complex, which is now a luxury accommodation. There's a bit of the East India Dock left uh, out on the Island of Dogs, and so on. But not much. Uh, any other European nation that you can think of that had an East India company tends to celebrate, uh, project, promote their East Indian enterprise. Um, but the British one, I think, by accident, uh, has been lost. Um, and therefore, uh, it's not very deeply embedded in our historical consciousness. Now, the company that had grown up by 1870 was, of course, fundamentally all about trade. Now, this famous painting by Pocock, again in 1817, uh, of the China fleet, demonstrates, I think, an image that was very uh, utmost in the minds of contemporaries when they thought about the East Indian trade. The East India Company vessels, these are 1,200 ton um, vessels carrying tea, porcelain, rosewood, luxury commodities uh, from Canton back to London. They were the super terrors uh, of their day. And what the artist has done here is show to any mariners out there a rather chaotic scene. They seem to be all over the places that they're being swept up in the cycle. Of course, what he's doing is showing you all the different perspectives um, of an East Indian. And I think many Britons clung to that image of the East India Company as a commercial enterprise. David McPherson, the great political economist, called it the greatest commercial organisation uh, uh, in history. But of course, in parallel, since the middle of the 18th century, other things have been going on. And if you like, the imperial gene that lay at the heart of the company um, had been defining new patterns of activity and behavior. Here we have a very famous painting by Francis Heyman, painted in the 1760s. And here we have Clyde of India receiving uh, sorry, the here, receiving from Mira Jafar, essentially uh, governments of the province, the richest province of India, that is Bengal, Bihar, and Orissa, following uh, the Battle of Plassey that Hal mentioned uh, earlier. And again, this is a painting that to contemporaries was replete with uh, imagery that they would have well understood. The gigantic elephant symbolizing the uh, Indian subcontinent. Clive, a private company employee operating beneath the Union flag. And the once powerful now the governor of Bengal, bending in supplication as he transfers power um, to Clive, the private company employee. Plus, he really wasn't a battle at all. It's been described as a business arrangement. 
and what right region took place near Jafar and his forces defected from the old Nawab Siraj of Dawla. And we know that Clive, who was seen personally present in the form of jewels and swords and all sorts of luxuries that you can see in Paris Castle near Welsh Hall, to the value of £234,000. Um, any values I give you in the course of this lecture, multiply them by about 100 to get current day value. So about £23 million came Clive's way in the form of presents. These are the sort of presents we like. Um, that transaction really highlighted two things that were going on. The transformation of the East India Company from a commercial enterprise into an imperial agency. But secondly, it highlighted the role of the individual and the prospect of making money very quickly in India. And of course, as you all know, Clive was the archetypal Nabal, the much maligned nouveau riche who returned to this country loaded with money and then spent it in a spectacularly vulgar way in all sorts of uh, different contexts. And of course, just around the corner from the Arton Institute in Berkeley Square at number 45, you will find Clive's um, London home. But he bought up land like it was going out of fashion. He attempted to bludgeon his way into Parliament. He spent lavishly on landed estates. He and his ilk became known as Nabobs, the corruption of the Indian word Nawa. And they weren't much maligned in print, in cartoons, on the stage. Uh, Britain has always been very suspicious of Nukarish, and these were Nukarish in the most spectacular way that imaginable. But the real success for the company came in 1765, in this scene here depicted uh, by Nathaniel Dance, which is the Treaty of Allahabad. And here we have Clive again, receiving this time from Mughal Emperor Shah Alam II, probably the most important document in Anglo Indian history, the Diwani. This was giving the East India Company the right to collect the territorial revenues of Bengal, Bihar, Marissa. All land rents, customs duties, stamp duties, you name it, were passed over from the sovereign power to a private trading company. And Clive estimated it, never a man uh, who would exaggerate, he reckoned it was about £4 million a year. I think that's an exaggeration because he liked to promote his own cause. But nonetheless, the symbol of, symbolism of this uh, and the reality of this meant that the East India Company became de facto sovereign power over the richest provinces uh, of northern India. There then ensued a very detailed, um, long-winded, and ultimately inconclusive argument legally about whether a private company can actually um, take on sovereignty on its own behalf or whether it can only act on behalf of the Crown. And it really hinged on whether Shah Alam was willingly giving Clive this as a gift, or whether it was being coerced from him as a result of war. And it goes back and forth. And in fact, British sovereignty over India was not declared uh, formally until 1813. So this very interesting period when the company, in effect, is governing uh, much of India in the name of Britain and acting as a sovereign power. Now, I'm sure you can all think of the contemporary examples. This would be the equivalent of, I don't know, Nike governing Brazil or something. It's quite astonishing uh, when you uh, come to think of it. As a result of that process, which Clive and his ilk set in motion, the East India Company moved out of its traditional three commercial footholds 
Madras, Bombay, uh, and Calcutta, and by 1804, had pushed all the way up the Ganges Valley here. These are the rich pickings here, really, but also taking this coastal strip and the area uh, in the centre there around uh, Hyderabad and so on. Obviously, much still remains in local control, but there's no doubt about it that by 1805, and certainly by 1830, the East India Company is ruling uh, the subcontinent. So, what's going on here? Clearly, there is a process of official expansion. A company that is empowered by the state and is armed by the state, or is enabled to arm itself, um, is exercising direct and aggressive um, control over foreign countries, many of them independent states here. But also what's happening, of course, is that individuals are seizing the opportunity to make money. So we have a combination of corporate and private enterprise acting hand in hand to create a situation which then projects power onto uh, native states, if you like. And everywhere you look in Britain, you will find examples of the money making that was taking place. Money made by individuals. About a month ago, my wife and I were invited to a wedding near Exeter. This is Escot House near Ottery St. Mary. When we got there, and I explored the grounds, I know I should have been drinking free champagne, but of course, the historian never sleeps. I was there with my camera because I recognised this as the home of Richard and John Kenaway. There is poor old Richard Kenway now. I like this picture of his statue. So he's got a sign next to which, which says, Heaven, Heaven mighty have fallen. He was all called one as his aide department. He now has a notice next to him which says, If the fire alarm sounds, please exit the building immediately. Um, but he was present at uh, many of the most important events that took place in southern India uh, during the 1780s and 90s at all, as all called Cornwallis's um, aid department. Uh, he was present at the siege of Sri Lanka Town in 1792 and the subsequent treaty, which gave the East India Company a lot of control over the power of the state of Mysore, which was then ruled by their pet noir to uh, Sultan. The house is absolutely stuffed in rafters with the richest artworks and treasures uh, that you can imagine. It's almost a sort of homage to Anglo India around 1780. I won't bore you with all the details, but um, it's this um, sort of scene, if you like. And what I've been doing uh, in my own academic research is identifying in Wales as many country houses that are similarly touched by East Indian investment. And there are many, many of them in very surprising places. And the interesting thing about Wales, of course, many interesting things about Wales, as how we might tell you, um, is that of course it's considered to be a provincial backwater um, in the 18th century, of course it isn't now. Um, but it seems to be very far removed from the world of the East India Company. Um, but in fact, the inventory is actually very considerable. Uh, quite a swing in territory, um, really from pristine as far as attendee, um, is full of country houses with collections like this and the stories that can be told like this. And a rather wonderful project has been going on at the University College London, uh, managed by my friend uh, Professor Margot Finn, called the East India Company at Home, which has a wonderful website if you can track it down which has been looking at the contents of English country houses, British country houses, and looking at the manifestations of wealth that were generated by people from East India Company service. And it's an extraordinary litter of wealth creation um, and expenditure on beautiful objects, as well as many mundane things as well. Now that's fine. That's all about individuals on the make really taking advantage of opportunities. 
But the relationship between the East India Company and Britain really went much deeper than that. First of all, the East India Company, as part of the money interest that I described earlier, went a very long way to strengthening the British state in the 18th century. Critically, I think, at a time when Britain was locked in that second hundred years war, the global struggle for supremacy against France, the East India Company proved to be an extraordinarily important ally to the British state. It loaned it very large sums of money on a regular basis. It made what were described as gifts, but also its troops and ships act as a sort of supplementary tactical reserve that could be thrown in against the French as and when necessary. So, for example, in 1796, when the British are struggling in the West Indies, it's actually East India Company ships that are used as troop tr transports to take thousands of British troops uh, into the Caribbean theatre of war. And I think uh, we have to see the East India Company uh, as a very senior partner in that military complex that Britain became um, in the uh, 18th century. The East India Company also strengthened the British economy at a critical moment in its development. And as some of you will be aware, there is very um, heated, or has been very heated controversy about whether simultaneously it led to the deindustrialization uh, of Asia. And we really haven't got time to go into that uh, today, but I will explore that uh, in the forthcoming book. It used to be thought that the wealth that was plundered at Plassey somehow sparked the British Industrial Revolution, because it used to be thought conventionally that the British Industrial Revolution began in 1760, three years after Plassey. So if you pick up old textbooks from the 1920s and 30s, you will often see reference to what was known as Plassey plunder. This is the loot that was returned to Britain and then began to stimulate very significant uh, economic activity, which led to industrialization. Now, I know in your next lecture, Professor Nicholas Crafts of the University of Warwick is going to be talking on industrialization, and he won't mention that at all, because that theory is now considered to be hopelessly redundant, because we've changed our chronological understanding and indeed our definition of industrialization. There was no big bang in 1760 that was sparked off by something suddenly happening. But what the East Indian wealth did do, coming back into Britain from the East Indian Company and from individuals, was stimulate a lot of economic activity. Money was spent on consumer goods, for example, teas, textiles, luxury goods, which significantly enhanced and improved the standard of living and indeed what Britain's consumed. But the East India Company also exported a lot. It's conventionally thought that Britain didn't have much to export to Asia because what could we offer in the 17th century? Wool textiles? Well, not with so many of them in Bombay, should we? But actually, when you look at the record and what I've been doing, is examining the way in which East India Company orders and indeed private smuggled trade offered key stimuluses or stimuli um, to industries at optimum moments in their development. The one that's close to home to us in Swansea is the copper industry. Swansea copper completely dominated world output by 1850. About 65% of all smelted copper came from the Lower Swans Valley. Now, it was really East India Company orders for copper that stimulated the growth of that industry in the 1720s, and huge quantities of Swansea copper found their way into the Asian economies for use as a coinage, uh, drinking vessels, salt and boiling pans, kettles, uh, and so on. And by 1760, the world's dominant Japanese copper industry had been completely obliterated in Asia. And when I talk 
to my friends who are Japanese economic historians or Indian economic historians, they only know two things about sport. They know that the top of the Premier League, of course, in football, but they also know about this story of copper. And they describe copper as being the harbinger of Britain's industrial revolution for Asia, not cotton textiles. And so it goes on. We can look at iron, we can look at armaments, etc., etc. There's a long list of commodities where sectors in Britain were critically stimulated by the British expansion in Asia. I repeat, this was not about causing the Industrial Revolution, but what expansion in Asia did was critically strengthen Britain's economy at that key moment. So what was the East Company? Well, those of you who did glance uh, at the materials that I pre-circulated will know that there are many answers to that question. And it largely depends who you asked. The East India Company had many friends, obviously, but it also had many enemies, radical critics and political economists, of course, who saw the monopoly as being anathema. They saw the company as actually hindering private enterprise rather than stimulating it. Well, at one level, of course, the East India Company was a recognizably modern corporation. The way that the joint stock company was set up in 1601, 1602, I think looks pretty logical to us. I've tried to rationalize it in an organizational chart. It's got a little bit awry in the transfer from uh, Mac to PC. But the way it operated with a board of directors, and even an elected board of directors, a supporting secretariat, very specialized staff, um, strong sense of vertical integration, very sophisticated information processing systems. My former student, Dr. Margaret Lakepeace, is here this evening, and she's the keeper of the East India Company Archive in the British Library. And she will tell you how efficient the information processing system uh, was, the use of indexes in particular, meant that the clerks in East India House at uh, the moment's notice could put their hand on information. The fundamental belief being that if you control information, then you can control enterprise and indeed uh, empire. The decision making was entirely rational. It was based on full information that was acquired as systematically uh, as possible. Of course, the fundamental difference with today was the speed of communication. Because to get information from India to the four months, shall we say, to write a dispatch and an instruction and send it back it would take a month or two, you then have to wait for the right saving season, and it would take three months to get your instructions back out. And that, to a large extent, explains why men like Clive of India were given or not given free brain, had free brain. Because whatever they were instructed to do, they could conveniently ignore, knowing that they were beyond the reach of London that effectively. But it might strike you, looking at that organizational chart, which, roughly speaking, is constructed from evidence around 1785, that that is the structure of a commercial organization. And yet, by the time that organization took that form, it had already governed 30 million Bengalis for 20 years. So it begs the question, where is the empire in all of that? Who is governing the empire? And it really comes down to this little office here, the examiner's office, a highly elite Specialist secretariat, half a dozen men um, who process information, made recommendations to the court of directors, and then wrote incredibly high minded dispatches that were sent back out to India um, to facilitate the governance of millions of Bengalis. Now, Modern day business historians and economic historians have argued 
that this represents the precursor of the modern firm. The modern multinational firm can be traced back to the East India Company. And they've drawn elaborate parallels with Ford and all sorts of uh, other companies. And I'm prepared to concede that there is something in that. But the problem with business historians, largely speaking, is that they don't look beyond the theory and the practice and the evidence of what was going on. And I think I would really ask them uh, to consider um, a few ways in which this organisation is actually fundamentally different from the modern form. And it's fundamentally different, I would argue, and have argued extensively, because while this organisation operated in pursuit of corporate goals and objectives, it also gave full reign to private enterprise, the private enterprise um, of its employees, the men like Clive, the commanders of its ships. They were allowed to trade on their own account while employed by the company, which obviously causes a conflict of interest. And that might seem rather odd to many of you, because this is the recipe for disaster. Why did they do it? Well, the directors did it because they were realists. They needed incentives to enable men operating thousands of miles away to at least devote some of their time to corporate activity. So what happened was that the East India Company, really from the 1670s onwards, having tried to prevent and stamp out private trade, um, began to license their employees to trade in certain commodities. In other words, commodities that did not rival those that the company were trying to procure uh, and sell. They paid their employees measly salaries, £10 a year, and therefore they were incentivized, it took them a month, uh, they were incentivizing their um, employees. They were incentivizing the commanders of ships to get the ships to Asia on time, in their own interest, but also in the interest of the commanders. They did it because they wanted to exert some sort of control over their employees. If they gave them this privilege, then so too they could take it away. And it was difficult, obviously, to control men operating thousands of miles away. This was one such technique. But they tried to create a strong sense of mutual interest. Britons abroad pursuing simultaneously private and corporate interest. That was the rationale behind it all. Well, of course, this created problems. Firstly, there was the competition, inevitably, with corporate interests, which could damage the profitability for stockholders and investors. If the private investors performed too well, then they could damage the company who employed them. Secondly, of course, as we've seen perhaps with Clive, private activity could run counter to the interests of the state or the crown. You've got private individuals in charge of armed forces by 1770 that number 30,000 men. The East India Company's army by 1770 was larger than the regular British army. Now, it could be the case that someone like Clive might deploy that armed force in his own interests and not in the interests of the company or indeed the state. And there was the worry of course, that this would cause war and expense. It would drag the state, perhaps, into conflicts that were best avoided. So what we find happening is that, given the public response to Clive and the Nabobs and the abhorrence of their extravagant behavior and expenditure, there is a story, far too complicated to tell today, of regulation and control being exerted on the company and its employees. From 1773 onwards, that's a great landmark, Lord North's Regulating Act, followed up by Pitt's India Act of 1784. And what they do is restrict, for example, the taking of presents 
they restrict the right of a company employee to lend money to Indians and so on. They're trying to get at the causes of corruption uh, and so on. Now, ironically, as monopoly rights were being eroded under assault from thinking from people such as Adam Smith and his acolytes, it was the company's governing skills in India, the attributes that it was displaying in terms of governing the Indian population, that saw it survive, not as a commercial company, because it lost its monopoly in India in 1813, and then lost its monopoly in the China trade in 1833. But it continued as a British administrative agency in India until 1858, when things went so horribly wrong for it and for Britain in the wake of the Indian mutiny uh, or uprising. So the company that we saw beginning as a commercial enterprise ends its days as a busted flush of a governing emergency. What we have, therefore, running through this story, and um, I've really only skimmed the surface of a very complicated story, is a mixture throughout of public and private interests being embodied and embedded in the East India trade. The company provided the overarching infrastructure, the ships, the forts, factories. It provided the support. It provided legitimization for aggressive private enterprise. And that private enterprise uh, was taken up with great enthusiasm by successive generations of East India Company servants. So my argument is that the monopoly, the much maligned East India Company monopoly, was in fact a fiction. There was no monopoly at all. There was a monopoly on paper, but in practice, um, we see rampant and very aggressive private enterprise. It is also possible to argue that the East India Company was a key agency in the development of Britain as the archetypal contractor state. A state in which the core functions of government are actually minimal, but where the welfare of the state is dependent upon myriad contractors, large and small, selling things to the state, performing services, or governing millions of square miles of ter territory. In recent years, I think as historians, we've heard far too much about how Britain was a fiscal military state in the 18th century. That is, a state that was really capable of raising money and men to fight wars. What historians haven't looked at so closely was how money was spent and how resources were actually deployed around the world. So we have a contractor state project now running across Europe, which is looking at models of how European states actually spent their money. And of course, in the British case, it was through private agencies. The British, or the English in particular, have always been remarkably good at getting other people to do their fighting for them and getting other people to spend money for them. They did this working in the national interest, the contractors, one of course generating profits for themselves and for investors. I would argue and conclude by saying that the East India Company was the senior contractor partner of the British state through the long 18th century. It was charged, if you like, with representing the crown and the city in the Indian Ocean world. That it did so with such great and sustained success was it because it was because it released private enterprise into areas that could not be reached or accessed either by the state or by some traders, people operating by themselves. It created a world of trade and a territorial empire, which meant that it ended its days very far distant, literally and metaphorically from where it had begun in 1600. Now that's where I was going to end. But on the train on the way up, I did what we all do. I read the Times newspaper from 1874. In 1874, the East India Company was finally wound up. By then, it was just a fiction. 
Um, but an act of parliament was passed, and all the remaining investors were paid a particular sum. And the Times published a sort of a lament to the East India Company, reflecting on its long history. And these are the final words of that lament, and it's worth just ending on. Now, when it passes away with the solemnities of parliamentary sepulture out of the land of the living, it is just as well as become to record that it, the East India Company, accomplished a work such as in the whole history of the human race no other trading company ever attempted, and such as none surely is likely to attempt in the years to come. Thank you very much.